Our next speaker is uh, Robert Dale. Uh, Robert has uh, acquired some insights that don't occur to every Ontario boy that uh, Canada doesn't stop 200 kilometers from the American border. Um, he learned that in part by riding a motorcycle to the Arctic Ocean and I can only hope that he had a windshield wiper on his bike helmet to, to deal with the bugs. In any event, what he's going to talk to us tonight about is a, a little more along our, our line of country than biking. Uh, he's going to tell us about uh, what must have been a rather grueling trip uh, ending up uh, where my trip on the Hood River began uh, at the headwaters. Robert. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the introduction. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, this is the story of our 50-day canoe trip uh, to the Hood River, uh, and we're traveling to the headwaters. And I must say, this place is legendary. The tundra is vast and open. You can see for miles. Uh, the area is extremely remote, uh, and this river drains into the Arctic Ocean. And the summers are short but explosive because that sun never sets, and you get these gorgeous mornings. And then the, the caribou. So each spring, the caribou will migrate thousands of kilometers from the boreal forest uh, and join large herds and also the muskox, a nice age survivor, they still thrive. And the barren land grizzly is still a common sight. You will see them uh, foraging for berries and uh, hunting uh, ground squirrel. And now a lot of people will assume the tundra is a flat, featureless place, but Wilberforce Falls will change that. The river, uh, the falls drop about 200 feet into this, into this gorge. And as you can see, the river is completely above the Arctic Circle, well away from any cities or roads. And just a quick uh, history of the area. The Inuit have called this place home for thousands of years. Um, and you can still see ancient tent rings uh, along the river. And in the corner is an old stone fox trap. And a lot of people assume the Inuit were just a coastal people, however, they traveled quite far inland. And this is the Northwest Passage. Uh, so the British have spent centuries um, exploring the Arctic, uh, basically for a faster trade route to China. So globalization is, is nothing new. Uh, so we have this character, John Franklin. Uh, well, I'm sure most people here know about him. His last expedition ended in tragedy with the loss of two ships and all men. Uh, he was, th uh, he led the, one of his first expeditions was to Wilberforce in the Hood River. So they came back with these images. And of course, in the days before photography, uh, it was quite common for naval officers to be trained in watercolors. So this was the, these were the first images that Victorian England, Englanders have seen. And then a little more recently, uh, this was taken by Bill Mason in 1986. Uh, his group of paddlers were the first recreational canoeists to visit the area. And his writings helped make it uh, very iconic. And with his partner, uh, Wally Scriber, they chose, uh, they attempted to run the canyon. And in the photo, you can see there's a tiny little canoe at the bottom. However, the river below the below the falls is a mess. It's a violent torrent, big waves, boiling eddies, and whirlpools. So unfortunately, they capsized and had to swim and ended up scaling the walls to get out. And also, we have to thank uh, this husband and wife duo, uh, Barbara Burton and the late George Strout. Uh, they're from the WCA. Uh, they spent many years returning to the Hood River compiling notes, updating maps, and frankly, it's their notes that help guide us on this trip. And once again, there's the hood. And as the title mentioned, uh, 
we took the scenic route. We took the back door. So frankly, we spent an extra month just traveling to get to the headwaters. And there's a, there's a more detailed map. Uh, so we fly into a little lake called Basler and spend about a week traveling upstream on the Emil River system, portaging into uh, the Parent River, and then onto the Copper Mine, upstream on a little tributary called the Ferry Lake River, and then across Lake Takijak, and then we'll eventually reach uh, the headwaters of the Hood. And in the early days, uh, it's still the Canadian Shield. We're in Boreal Forest, and we'll be transitioning onto the tundra. This is our organizer, Eva Conclova. This will be her fifth Arctic River. Uh, she's found, she's recruited a bunch of friends and strangers, and this will be my first Arctic River. And just a quick introduction. We have Sarah from Toronto, uh, Greg from Fenland Falls, uh, Kurt from New Jersey, uh, Lisa from Vermont, and for those in the back row, that's myself. And also on this trip, we have the luxury of a resupply. So we'll be joined by a grandson and grandfather, Hugh and Sylvain, and also Rosemary from Toronto. So after months of planning and conference calls, we finally get to load up the plane and head out into the bush. So step one is the Emil River system. We'll be spending about a week traveling upstream. And yes, it's the Boreal Forest. You could blur your eyes and pretend you're in tomogamy, but there's a few, few little differences you'll notice. Uh, first off, there, it's very remote. There are very few signs of any, any human. There's no traces of humans, but when you do find them, they look like this. Uh, fuel drums are quite common in, in the north. Also, you'll start noticing some of the Arctic wildflowers and signs of caribou uh, just about every day. And lastly, the Arctic sun. That sun will never set, and for the entire 50 trips, I've never turned on a flashlight. Uh, so the early days of the trip is mostly lake hopping with some portaging. Occasionally we need to line the canoes upstream, but there's always time for some fishing. Uh, yes, and the portages are extremely rough. Um, and in this case, finding a rusty kettle is actually cause for celebration. Just a little bit of rusty old metal confirms that we're on the portage and not just wandering aimlessly through the bush. <laughs> These are just a few of the feathered friends we find on Mesa Lake. So to finish this stage of the trip, we have uh, a two-day portage over the height of land. And a lot of times you can find Zen in the wilderness, but it's not today. This is boot camp, basically. And our home for the night is just at this little peat bog, but once it's all complete, we're now in the parent uh, river system. And from here, we'll, we'll paddle for another week and connect with the, the copper mine. Now, kind of think of this area as big sky country. Uh, you'll notice the trees have started to, to fade away. And when you're paddling for hours, it's really easy to just kind of let your gaze wander up, look at the birds, the clouds. And in this case, uh, we actually were able to watch a thunderhead just scroll by in the distance from a, from a safe spot. And finally, after 10 days, we get our first little taste of white water and a downstream push. And you'll notice Eva is squinting madly. That's one of the, uh, I don't want to call it a disadvantage, but that's one of the things that happens with the low Arctic sun. Some days that sun would just punch you in the face. And often we plan our days to, to end on an esker, simply because the land is always, always flat. And now an esker is basically, uh, uh, it's a mound of gravel and sand. Uh, res uh, they were created from the last ice age, basically uh, gravel deposits from meltwater rivers that were under the ice. 
And with this esker, you can see a modern river is actually intersected and cut it in half. And also, the eskers are good for wa wildlife as well. Uh, caribou will, these are also known as caribou highways, because on the migrations, they'll, they'll uh, travel on the flat, flat land. And now, many of you have read, 2016 is the hottest year in the Arctic, and it got a little messy. We ran out of river in sections. So the portages just kept adding up. Uh, what was supposed to be easy swifts were now arduous portages. However, it wasn't all bad. The other 50% of the rapids were runnable. Uh, very shallow, it was basically a slalom course, and the goal was simply to find any channel with enough water to float a boat. And that rock, re rock neck necked nest lake went to the Copper Mine River. And in a few days, we'll cover great distance because it's a high volume river. And as you can see, we're back on uh, the boreal forest. The trees are thickening up again. And as I said, the, it's a high volume river. So it's a bit of a shock to the system to go from the shallow Perrant to the Copper Mine. And the first two rapids, uh, they're not hard, but just intimidating because it's a big wave. And it's basically just a matter of finding the dry line between um, the standing waves and the eddy line. And now you can see here, Kurt decided to, uh, to skip this portage and run it solo. A lot of times people think of white water as hooting, hauling, a big adrenaline rush. Uh, it was fascinating watching Kurt because uh, it was more like a chess game. He was always thinking two months, uh, sorry, two moves in advance, and always calm and stoic, even in the big waves. And then this set of swifts, uh, they could run for a couple of kilometers of just easy, effortless paddling. And now the copper mine, it'll continue to the Arctic Ocean, past the September mountains. And this is where we get off. If this is a Think of this as a, an expressway. We're getting off. This is our exit ramp to the Fairy Lake River. And it's a gorgeous little spot. And Sarah claims it's the best fishing of the entire trip. And the grayling are basically jumping out of the water to, to get the flyer lure. Yes, this will be the most challenging sections. It'll take about six days to cover a short distance. The terrain is rough, and it's all upstream. And our first challenge is a four kilometer portage. And it'll look nothing like this. <laughs> it's a little more like this. Uh, very thick. I highly recommend them bringing red or orange backpacks. And I even confess to losing the canoe for about 10 minutes. Uh, there's no actual portage, it's more or less game trails that randomly braid and twist and then disappear for no reason. Also, for the next few days, it's getting a little colder. It's time for toques and balaclavas. And July 21 is a date I'll never forget because it snowed. It actually snowed four times that day. Uh, just a light dusting, but it came in with a, a very powerful northwest gale. And occasionally, we'll just stop for a tea break to warm up. And life isn't all bad. There's plenty of good fishing. The Fairy Lake River also has this little canyon. And I imagine only a handful of people have ever seen this. And I think, what would it be like to paddle this? But it doesn't matter. It's time to portage, and we're traveling upstream. It's a cold, windy day, and it's mountain goat-style climb, goat climb to get to the top of the ridge. And over the next few days, we'll continue to work our way upstream. And the very last set of swifts, we see that graceful stride and our first caribou. Now, weeks earlier, the large herds would have migrated past. So these are just a few young bucks that are lingering behind. And we get our first glance of Lake Takijak. And after all these days of traveling upstream, we get to kick up our feet for a little while and take a breather. Now this is Lake Takijak, 
And even before the trip started, I knew this would be good. The, uh, you can see a mountain range uh, that literally divides the lake in half. You can see those thick contour lines of the Hingitook Mountains. Absolutely gorgeous. I, I can only imagine how old they are just because the tops are rounded off into plateaus. Uh, our plan to hike the peninsula was bordered by this little guy. Uh, luckily, we were still in the canoes before we spotted him. Uh, the interesting thing was, while we were whispering and looking at the bear, it was hard to see, actually judge how big he was because in the tundras, there's not a lot of uh, reference points for scale. And it wasn't until I saw the photos that I realized, yeah, that's, that's a big bear. Uh, however, we do get our day hike uh, up on this ridge. This is our campsite. And one of the things I love about the Arctic is that wherever there's a cliff, there's a pretty safe bet there's going to be a birds of prey. And so we saw uh, the rough-legged hawk. And I would have loved to stay and linger on the lake, but um, it's, it's too risky to stay on the lake too long because if a storm comes, we could be windbound for days and risk botching the, the resupply. However, I do love these Arctic mornings. Now, as we continue uh, northeast, we leave the mountains behind and we get to the height of land. And at a campsite, we actually see this guy wander by. Yeah, so we, we now are ready for the last height of land portage, but there's no rush. We're seasoned veterans at this point. We get to sleep in, have pancakes and coffee. And soon enough, we hit the trail. Also on the portage is this little pond. And there's a trick uh, Greg is doing. He's raising his arms in a Y shape to try to lure the caribou a little closer. They have horrible eyesight, so the trick usually works, but just for a few minutes. <laughs> and now we're officially in the Hood River system, just a few days away from our resupply. And now the fabled legendary Hood River, it starts off a little rough around the edges. It's very rocky, craggy. And soon enough we hear the sound of civilization and the motor. It's now uh, August 1st. And everyone rushes to the lake for handshakes and greetings. And the food is quickly unloaded. And we say hello to Hugh and Sylvain and Mary Ann. Oh, sorry, uh, Rosemary. And we now have coffee again. The last batch was brewed this morning. And I can't lie. A resupply in the Arctic? It's better than Christmas. Apples and oranges have never tasted this good before. There's now salad, a box of wine, chocolate. And I have to confess, that box of wine lasted only a couple hours. <laughs> We've been traveling hard for about a month, and it was time for some rest and celebration. And a resupply also means a resupply of conversation. We've been tra uh, changing partners every week or so. But now there's new conversation. Hugh is 81, a veteran of the North, a retired RCMP officer. And in the early days, uh, it's mostly lake travel with some descents. And it's best to stick with the trip notes for finding campsites. It's a, it can be a challenge to find level ground in this area. And it's no big surprise, water levels are low. Uh, so Kurt is able to uh, paddle this, this shallow section, but we're absolutely devastated because what's around the corner is a disaster. We fear we're going to be walking the Hood River, and the portages keep adding up. And later on, we spot these little guys. It can be tricky to spot muskot from a boat, but it's basically, why is that boulder moving? And then it's a matter of taking a closer look. We have to thank Greg for these great photos. Now, Esker Lake is where everything changes. Uh, the, the craggy rocks are now replaced by sand and eskers and rolling hills. 
So this is the Hood River that most people have fallen in love with. And most in Curtin, oh, and there's a, a massive asker. And most importantly, we have current again. Now, this is a nice little spot, Kingamit Falls. This is also where we had a, a bear encounter. Uh, we were quite fortunate. Uh, this bear was merely just a curious bear, but he, in a matter of 60 seconds, he was able to climb the ridge and take a look at us. However, he only took one glance at us, saw five humans, and just ran. He must have thought the aliens have landed. Yes, this is just below the falls. And when fishing's good, it's great. Yes, water levels are still low, but life is good, and we continue to make good time. Yes, this is the confluence of the Wright River. It's a mandatory stopping spot and a very special place for... Uh, George Strout and Barbara Burton. There's a beautiful cascade. And the fascinating part is that there's some ancient tent rings here. So the Inuit would have hunted caribou from the, sorry, monitored the caribou herds from the, the high ground. Uh, today the only hunter is this peregrine falcon perched on the highest point. Uh, there's caribou crossing. Once again, Kurt shows us how to find the dry line. Now this campsite, uh, this represents our last day on the Hood River paddling. And I must say, this is the best paddling day of my life. The white water is amazing. The river keeps flowing. Young Sylvain is showing more uh, confidence in the bow. And between sets, once again, we see moving boulders. And we'll get some more caribou photo. Now, it's even better than finding a caribou or two is finding the whole herd. And frankly, even the veterans on the trip are, are surprised to see a herd this big. And so for about 45 minutes, we just hunch in the bushes and pass the binoculars back and forth. We can watch uh, the alpha male bully some of the other members. And occasionally, they'll wander a little closer to us notice some weird humans, and then just wander back to the herd. Now, this is the last 10K before uh, the falls. It's a nice section of river with the, uh, the river braids, and there's a good current. And in no time, we make it to the end. There's a quick hoot and a holler, because we finally reached the end. Setting up camp will have to wait, because it's time to explore. And the scenery is, is amazing. And in the misty air, I was surprised to find in little nooks there'd be ferns growing. There's a nice wide shot of the river. Because the river bends, it's actually hard to get the entire falls into a photograph. Yes, the scale is, is quite uh, impressive. Now, we're here for about four days before our charter plane comes and picks us up. So there's some more exploring to do. And there's a scree slope that gets you to the edge of the river. And now a lot of people will come to the Arctic looking for wolves and the majestic caribou. I honestly fell in love with the siksik, the little Arctic ground squirrels. They would never steal food, but they would come to the kitchen, explore, and be a little verbal. They'd chirp at us. And now, at the end of the trip, we have a, one last portage. It's two kilometers to an esker where a twin engine otter will pick us up. It'll be equipped with tundra, tile, tundra tires to land on the gravel. However, we can't leave quite yet. It's time to take a stupid selfie and run the canyon. Now, I'm a firm believer, there, firm believer that you should get your white water kicks close to home and play it safe in the back country but this is just too cool to miss. It is the hottest year in the Arctic and levels are low, so this violent torrent is basically a clean class three run. 
and the lofty walls of the canyon disappear behind us, and we say goodbye to the river, and now it's time to pack up. And I must say, the scenery was great, but what really makes a trip truly unforgettable is having a good crew with you. And I have to thank them all. It takes a lot of pooling of efforts to make this all happen. And last, oh, and before we leave, the pilot does one last circle around the falls. And after this trip, there was a lot of tough portages, but let's forget all that, leave it behind. I have a three-minute video of just the fun stuff. <laughs> 